Kingslade is located in the Wellow Valley in the county of Bath and North East Somerset. The valley is well known for its tufa depositing springs, having been subject to paleoenvironmental research for many decades. During routine field visits to the valley by staff at Bath Spa University, Mesolithic style lithic material was observed associated with a low mound of tufa in a field adjacent to the Wellow Brook. Given the known association of Mesolithic activity at tufa depositing springs, excavation commenced and took place over two seasons in 2004 and 2005. Our excavations revealed a rich and unusual sequence of late Mesolithic activity. Through a discussion of the archaeology from the site, we would like to explore how the activities and traditions of practice which were occurring at this place offer an opportunity to examine the relational dynamics between past hunter-gatherers, aurochs, unusual natural places, and seemingly mundane material culture. By exploring these relationships, through the activity from a single site, we hope to be able to offer an intimate glimpse into past hunter-gatherer worlds. The Tufa depositing spring at Langley's Lane activated at approximately 6,500 calibrated BC. At this time, and for a period of up to 500 years, the spring was at its wettest, forming small areas of boggy or marshy ground, which would have been visible as a murky white wetland, set within a wooded environment with some open structure. Broadly contemporary with the activation of the spring, a young female aurochs was killed at or near to the site and primary butchery was carried out. This is evidenced by an assemblage of aurochs head and feet bones recovered from the spring waters and the contemporary dry land surface. Some of the bones showed clear evidence of butchery and marrow extraction. The aurochs remains were recovered from both the spring waters and the dry land immediately adjacent to the spring. Those from the spring waters were found in a discrete area, whilst those from the dry land were found in five distinct clusters with a few isolated examples. Lithic material was closely associated with both the dry land and wetland bone assemblages. The dry land lithic assemblage is representative of the full reduction sequence with formerly retouched tools comprising microliths, a scraper and a denticulate. The lithics from the wetland, however, only consisted of blades and flakes. Generally, the lithic material from both the wet and dry land assemblages <coughs> were in fresh condition, with some flakes and blades evidencing edge damage, suggestive of use. Given their association with butchered formal remains, it is possible that they were used for this task, though no use wear or residue analysis was undertaken. The deposition of some of the aurochs elements and lithic material, which was possibly used during butchery, into the wetland is thought to represent the culturally appropriate mode of deposition. Such has been demonstrated for the faunal material in the, um, in the waters of Paleo Lake Flixton at Star Car. In addition, at Langley's Lane, those bones not deposited within the spring waters were assembled into neat clusters on the dry land surface near to the water's edge suggesting a further respectful treatment of this animal in death. The clusters were small, amounting to a scoop or couple of handfuls of bones and lithics, indicative of subtle individual actions. That these practices are occurring at a spring with unusual properties adds another dimension to this ritual. The formation of tufa under wet and turbulent conditions produces deposits which are onchoidal in structure. This onchoidal tufa was visible in the trench and its form and colour closely resembled bone. And it is likely it would have been visible, at least in part, above the waterline of the spring. <coughs> Depositing some of the remains of the young female aurochs into these spring waters may have been perceived as a continuing of a tradition, giving the site a conceptual sense of origins. Also associated with this successful kill of an aurochs was a group of nine small and shallow pits cut into the dry land near to the spring waters. Eight of the nine pits contained a range of materials, 
All eight contain small, colourful stones, which were not immediately local to the site. All eight also contained lithic material, comprised primarily of debitage fragments. Some of the lithics were coated in tufa, suggesting they had contact with the spring waters at some point. As the pits are, far, are, are away from the wetland, these items could not have washed in. Rather, it is considered that this represents a deliberate retrieval of lithic material from the spring waters for deposition. In two of the pits, one certain and one probable, hand-moulded tufa balls were recovered. The intact tufa ball contains small fragments of ferrous material, whilst the other, which lost its form, contained wild boar remains, lithics, and colourful stones. The wild boar remains from the dissolved tufa ball are represented by one tooth and seven bone fragments. The only other wild boar remains recovered from the site were three further teeth found on the dry land surface, suggesting that this animal was not killed on the site and these teeth and bones are likely to have been curated and brought to the site for deposition. The incorporation of wild boar remains into the collected tufa suggests that this animal was subject to a different set of cultural practices. At the beginning of the sixth millennium calibrated BC, the springs started to dry out, characterised by a slower or more intermittent, perhaps seasonal, flow of water. During this drier phase, people continue to visit the Tufa Spring. These visits appear to have been concerned with depositing lithic and faunal material into the spring waters. 159 struck lithics were recovered from the spring deposits. These were stratified both horizontally and vertically and are suggestive of discrete episodes of deposition over time. The lithic material comprises debitage, including flakes, some with edge damage, suggestive of use, broken blades, broken bladelets, and debitage fragments. The retouch component includes notched pieces, a scraper, and a denticulate. The character of this assemblage suggests, suggests that it may have derived from a habitation or activity area rather than being composed of specially crafted items. It's use, th this use of flint napping waste, broken blades and bladelets, and complete and broken flakes is somewhat evocative of the lithic assemblage which was deposited into the pits during the wetter phase of the spring. These seemingly mundane items, many at the end of their use life, became charged with new meaning as they moved from one contextual setting to another. The recovered faunal remains total eight specimens, two aurochs elements, one red deer tooth, and five fragments identified as mammal. Apart from one element, the faunal remains were recovered during wet sieving from the edge of the spring waters, indicative of being carefully placed at the edge of the spring. This differs somewhat from the lithic material, which appears to have been thrown into the spring at different times, as it was stratified both horizontally and vertically throughout. What is notable about this drier phase is the apparent absence of activity on the dry land. The excavation focused only on the dry land to the north and northwest of the spring. As such, it is possible that dry land activity associated with this phase is preserved elsewhere. If the absence of activity on the dry land is a true reflection of attitudes towards the spring, then visits now focused on the deposition of items into the spring waters. This drier phase of the spring is believed to have lasted for approximately 1,000 years, with the spring drying out at some point during the beginning of the fifth millennium calibrated BC. Once the spring had dried out, a low white mound of consolidated tufa would have been visible. This mound would have quickly colonized with vegetation and evidence of the spring would soon dissolve back into the landscape. As such, the activity associated with this phase is likely to have occurred soon after the spring dried out, when the low white mound was at least still partly visible. <clears throat> A large pit was dug cutting the boundary of the tufa mound and the adjacent deposit. 
This pit contained lithic material and colourful small stones, redolent of the pit contents from the initial wetter phase of the spring. Interestingly, some of these lithics and stones had tufa adhering to them. As the spring had now dried out, it is likely that these lithics and stones were encountered during the digging of the large pit as it cut through the tufa mound and encountered earlier material deposited into the spring waters. This engagement with the material history of the site allowed the physical and conceptual reanimating of past traditions. This pit was then recut by what are believed to be two post holes, which would have held slender posts approximately 150 millimetres in diameter. These posts mark the location of the pit, but they also mark the edge of the tufa mound. Additionally, on the surface of the tufa mound, <coughs> six stake holes were observed. Also at the junction of the tufa mound and the surrounding deposit, a discrete spread of stones was laid measuring 1.25 by 0.8 metres. Found on and between these stones were one aurochs and nine large mammal bone fragments and 34 lithics. The lithic material comprised two scrapers and one microlith, whilst the debitage consisted of core rejuvenation flakes and larger primary and secondary flakes. The character of the lithic material is different to that on the deposit surrounding the stone spread and the tufa mound, suggesting a certain amount of zoning of activity was taking place. Faunal remains were also observed on the, were also found on the deposit adjacent to the low tufa mound and included three aurochs elements and five mammal fragments. Although no butchery marks were observed on the faunal remains from the stony spread or the adjacent deposit, the identifiable elements are represented by head and foot and ankle bones as in other phases. Rather than depositing non-meat-bearing elements into watery contexts or small midden-like scoops, as was seen during the preceding two phases at Langley's, perhaps now the bringing of these elements to the site was something akin to a ritualized scattering over and near to the stony spread, an appropriate mode of deposition. This final phase of activity at Langley's can be defined by the need to visibly mock the location of the site. That the low tufa mound was rapidly dissolving back into the landscape generated the need to formally define this space. Throughout the site's use life, it is the tufa mound and is the tufa spring and later the low tufa mound, which is the focus of activity. Unusual and or distinctive places of the landscape are often often feature as significant focal points for traditional societies. The roles and meanings attached to these places are culturally specific. Archaeologically, we can observe the material residues of past practices, and through these, start to explore what these places may have meant to past people. The spiritual role of certain animals in the belief systems of hunter-gatherers is well documented ethnographically. Certain animals and animal spirits can be a powerful force with a unique status, which requires special treatment in life and death. This, the respectful treatment of aurochs through time at Langley suggests that this animal was ever present, though it must be stressed that this repeated reference to aurochs and hunting is one that would have fluid meaning. The treatment of faunal remains in a respectful manner amongst certain polar hunter-gatherers has broadly been linked to conceptions of regeneration and rebirth. Broadly, the specific treatment of certain animals in death is often associated with safeguarding future hunting success and ensuring the animal and their souls can be reborn. These metaphors could be further conceived and articulated through the deposition of lithic material at the end of its use life into the spring waters during the drier phase of the spring, as well as through the retrieval of tufa-coated lithic material from the spring waters during the wetter phase of the spring. The coating of tufa on the lithics has a striking, striking visual similarity to the cortex found on flint nodules and could be seen as the flint regrowing its skin. And Davis has also suggested that tufa resembles the vermix that coats the skin of newborn babies. Langley's was not just a place where people came to carry out depositional activities. 
the practice of retrieving lithic material from the spring waters, as well as the collection of tufa material to form tufa balls, demonstrates that this was a dynamic relational engagement, one perhaps of mutual reciprocity, whereby people can give to the spring, but the spring was also an active participant, coating, covering, and containing these performances and changing the physical form of this landscape. These mutual performances can also be observed with the physical digging into the tufa mound after the spring had dried out. That people were physically encountering the material history of the site may have worked to reanimate knowledge and history. The activity at Langley's Lane occurred over 1500 years and probably longer. That people continued to visit this site and carry out depositional and other activities over this long time period is remarkable. As one might expect, the archaeological evidence demonstrates that these activities were not fixed. This is a site where aurochs, tufa, lithics and hunters became entangled within a relational dynamic which appears to have endured for the life and afterlife of the spring. The tufa deposits and the embodied and conceptual performative nature of depositional practices became a repository for histories and stories, which could be remembered, remade, and reimagined at this significant place. Thank you. <laughs>